Welcome to this presentation on the role that physical attractiveness plays in interpersonal attraction. We've all heard the old uh, proverb, don't judge a book by its cover, as if there's something shallow and wrong about making judgments about other people or liking them based upon their looks. And I don't disagree that this doesn't sound like a good thing, but the truth of the matter is that we judge books by their covers all of the time and that we do in fact place a lot of importance on people's physical appearance, for better or worse. So in this set of slides, we're going to talk a little bit about what some of the characteristics that make up physical attractiveness are. Being physically attractive gives a person all kinds of advantages in life. There's something called a halo effect, which means that when we know one good thing about a person, we generalize that to think all kinds that the person must have other good qualities as well. And when somebody is physically attractive, we know that there's one good quality because we can see it up front. And so physically attractive people are assumed to have all kinds of good qualities like intelligence, for example, that uh, less attractive people don't have quite so much. And what is considered attractive is surprisingly consistent across cultures. Yes, there's certainly some individual variation in what people like, but there's remarkable agreement cross-culturally about what constitutes attractiveness. I think the authors of your textbook play this down a little more than they should. Research consistently shows that the same standards of attractiveness are used um, for men and women pretty much everywhere, and that what is considered physically attractive is not simply a matter of social construction. In fact, there are, are good evolutionary reasons why certain things um, signal beauty to us. Let's begin by talking about what makes a face attractive. Two characteristics that are extremely important in judging the attractiveness of a face are symmetry and normativity. Symmetry refers to the fact that if you were to draw a line right down the center of a person's face and fold the face over on itself, if it matches up perfectly, it's completely symmetrical. And the closer a face is to being completely symmetrical, the more attractive we think it is. Symmetry is advertising all kinds of good things to us. Uh, it's advertising youth. As you get older, one of the things that happens is your face gets less symmetrical. You get a little more lopsided in the face as you age. Also, symmetry can be disrupted by disease and accidents, uh, the presence of parasites. So a person with a non-symmetrical face uh, is signaling perhaps some sort of problem that at least in a mate we may prefer not to have. Normativity refers to how average is the face. And at first glance, this doesn't sound right because aren't attractive faces special? They're not average? Well, the way to think about it is that attractive faces are perfectly average. In other words, if you were to take a large group of individuals, and you could do this separately for males and a large group of females, and use a computer program to morph all of their faces together so that you end up with a composite face, that's the average of all of the other faces, no matter what the people in the original group look like, you will end up with a very attractive face. Let me give you an example of this. This picture shows the finalists for the Miss Germany um, pageant in 2007. I'm going to be showing you a composite face based on the finalists from 2002 in a moment, but I couldn't find a group a picture for the contestants in Miss Germany for 2002, but I assume they look pretty much like this group of finalists from 2007. So imagine a situation where we take all of the faces in this picture and morph them into one face. Before I show you that, um, here is a picture of the woman who won the title of Miss Germany in 2002. And yes, she's an attractive woman. The picture on the left shows her right after she won the title, and the picture on the right is uh, one with her hair pulled back and she doesn't have all of her makeup on, uh, but nonetheless, of course, an attractive woman. 
This is the picture of virtual Miss Germany. This is the face that you get when you uh, average all of the faces for the whole group of finalists in that pageant. This is not a real person. This individual does not exist. But as you can see, the end result of averaging those faces together is quite attractive. Now you might say, well, of course it is because we were averaging the faces of a bunch of beauty queens. That doesn't matter. If we had a comparable sized group of people uh, who were not pre-selected for being attractive, we would still end up with a highly attractive face in the composite. Here's a side-by-side -side photo of the virtual Miss Germany and the real Miss Germany from the same year. And I would have to say that the title would go to virtual Miss Germany if it was a head-to-head -head competition between the two of them. Some evidence that things like normativity and symmetry that predict the attractiveness of faces, uh, evidence that these things are in fact related to health in some way, is uh, evident in studies where people make judgments about the attractiveness of faces of people when they were young. A standard way of doing this is to find very old yearbooks from a college or a high school and ask people to make judgments about the attractiveness of the faces. And then you do a little bit of research to find out how long these people lived. We've done studies like this at Knox College and we have replicated this effect. Uh, there has been a significant relationship between the attractiveness of a person's face when they're young and how long they actually lived. Now it's not perfect, a lot of good looking people die young and some people that aren't so good looking live a long time. But on average, there's a relationship between the attractiveness of the face during youth and how long the person lives into old age. So these two uh, lines of research line up pretty nicely. So let's talk a little bit about what makes a male attractive to a female. Now there's some research that indicates to some extent that this depends upon the stage of a woman's menstrual cycle when she's making the judgments. This has recently been called into question and I'll talk about that a little more in a bit. But when females are judging the attractiveness of males, the face is the most important factor that they look at. And all of the things we just talked about, symmetry and normativity, go into making judgments of male faces. In addition to the face, um, tallness is a good characteristic for men to have. It adds to their attractiveness. A tapering V-shaped physique where the shoulders are broader than the waist. And there are some things that um, women pay more attention to that men think they do. Uh, how you smell, uh, what your butt looks like, your eyes, your legs, and your general portrayal of health. Um, men think that women pay much more attention to the size of muscles. And not that these can't be considered attractive, but they're not weighted as heavily as men think they are. But let's get back to the face for a moment. Some research has indicated that when women are not in the fertile stage of their menstrual cycle, when they're not ready to conceive, that they often prefer what we might think of as baby-faced males. Uh, they're perceived as more honest and warm, not as dominant, uh, they have bigger eyes. Um, but when a woman is in the fertile stage of her period, when she is able to conceive, she shows a strong preference for male faces that have what we might call mature features. Thick brows and lips, square jaw, smaller eyes. This is a picture of Pat Tillman. He was a well-known National Football League player who gave up his football career to volunteer to go and fight in Afghanistan. And he was killed in a tragic friendly fire accident uh, where he was shot by his own troops when he was mistaken for the enemy. His face is a classic example of the mature features that women find handsome in a male face, especially when they're in the fertile stage of their menstrual cycle. Now, as I said earlier, this difference in what women prefer at different stages of their cycle um, has been demonstrated in some studies, but some recent studies have had trouble replicating it. And so I'm going to say that it's an effect, but uh, at this point in time, I want you to be aware that 
Um, how much we trust it is still sort of up in the air. Nevertheless, it's kind of an interesting idea. So let's talk a little bit about what men find to be physically attractive in women. In an earlier set of slides, I emphasized the point that men always value physical beauty more highly than do women. Yes, women like attractive men, but for men, physical beauty is a much higher priority. And the things that men tend to find attractive in women are things that signal important reproductive information. Uh, for example, uh, is the woman young enough and healthy enough to uh, be a good reproductive bet? Is she able to bear children? And are the children likely to be healthy? And so men like a strong um, signal of youth and anything that makes a woman look younger uh, makes her more attractive. And this should not be surprising for anybody to hear. Uh, if you look at the multi-billion dollar uh, beauty industry, all the makeup and hair products, you don't find a bunch of 20-year-old women trying to make themselves look 60. But you do see a lot of 60-year-old women trying to make themselves look a lot younger. Uh, so it's understood that young is the beauty ideal. And there are a variety of different things that will signal a youth. Um, symmetrical face, clear skin and eyes, thick, lustrous hair, full lips, long legs, good muscle tone, high energy level, immature facial features. We don't like um, strong jaws in women and other features that might be more masculine appearing. These are all honest signals of youth. They're hard to fake. And so having these things, uh, if you're not talking about cosmetic surgery, uh, will make a woman be more attractive to a man. Also, the waist to hip ratio. Um, if you measure the size of a woman's waist and place it over her hips, the ideal size is approximately point, the ideal proportion is approximately 0.7. If the waists are about 70% the size of the hips, then it's judged to be more attractive. One of the reasons why this waist to hip ratio uh, signals attractiveness is because it's also signaling that the woman is the right age to be bearing children. Um, little boys and little girls have waist to hip ratios of approximately 0.9. And when puberty kicks in, little boys' waist to hip ratio doesn't change that much. Uh, little girls, however, undergo quite a change and the waist to hip ratio uh, declines to ideally around 0.7. As a woman begins to age and starts moving into middle age, the waist to hip ratio creeps up again. So men are drawn to this 0.7 waist to hip ratio because it's sending a signal that the woman is just the right age uh, to be reproductively interesting. Now, sometimes in class, I will have students object that uh, what we like in a body is kind of socially constructed. And isn't it true that at some points in history and in some other cultures, people like heavier women and in some places they like thinner women? And yes, that's true. Remember, what we're attracted to is health. And so if you come from a country that's ravaged by disease and there's a lot of poverty, nutrition levels are not good, a woman who's got some weight on her uh, is signaling health. She has access to food, she's um, free from disease, and this will be attractive to us. The thing that isn't changing from culture to culture and time to time though, is looking at the waist to hip ratio. So don't confuse waist to hip ratio with body size. A larger woman will still be considered attractive if the waist to hip ratio is correct, um, just as with a thinner woman. This research, by the way, has had some uh, real world applications. Uh, somebody thought to look at Barbie dolls to see what the waist to hip ratio in uh, Barbie dolls was, and it was something kind of freaky, 0.5 or something, and they actually started remaking Barbie dolls to have the waist to hip ratio be a little more realistic. It still isn't quite where it needs to be, but um, they changed it as a result of this research. So waist, waist to hip ratio is another important signal. There are also some subtle things that we don't hear about that often 
that will also uh, be a signal of youth and fertility and hence make a female more attractive. There's something called a limbal ring. That dark circle around the iris of the eye, the iris is the colored portion of the eye. In the slide here, you can see that dark circle around it. The um, dark limbal ring is an honest signal of youth. And your limbal ring begins to fade and get lighter uh, as you get older. And after the age of 25, it starts to sort of steadily disappear. Uh, I'm told that there are places in the world now where you can get contact lenses that kind of superimpose a uh, limbal ring on there. Uh, to keep the eye looking young. So we'll respond favorably to eyes with uh, pronounced limbal rings. Lumbar curvature is also a signal. The um, pictures you see in the slide here on the red carpet, the uh, Oscars or Golden Globes or whatever the award show is that these are taken at, um, you'll notice that women in these uh, events often wear backless dresses. Uh, this is a way of showing off what we call lumbar curvature. Um, women's Spines are designed a bit differently than men's because if they were the same when they became pregnant, uh, the stress on the back would become unbearable. And so uh, women of childbearing age actually have a curvature that kind of tilts them backwards. Uh, that tends to disappear with age and doesn't appear until after puberty. So lumbar curvature is another honest signal of youth and fertility that uh, men will respond to favorably. So when you think of all of these different features we talked about, it shouldn't be surprising to find that studies show that males have greater dating interest and greater, greater sexual interest in, in women that have these features, and that they say things like they would be more likely to choose them for a job or to perform self-sacrificial activities for them, like volunteering to load a truckload of furniture or donating blood or a kidney, or they'd be more likely to engage in physically risky activities for them. Uh, like attempting a half mile from shore swimming rescue or saving them from the second story of a burning building or jumping on a terrorist hand grenade. I'm not making this up. These are things that in studies, uh, males uh, indicate how likely they'd be to do these for different women and the attractiveness of the woman is a strong predictor of how likely they say they would be to do these things. Whether they would actually do them or not is another question. And let me talk about one more study that shows how, uh, that how well people match up on physical attractiveness is a very important part of the attraction process. Um, in some ways, I think this study unfairly set up a situation where the physical attractiveness was especially important, but it was a study done way back in the 1960s at the University of Minnesota. It was a computer dance where people were paired up for a date by a computer. Now, back in the 1960s, being paired up for a computer dance uh, was kind of an exotic thing. Computers were just starting to be a thing. And the people in this study, this picture has nothing to do with it. I just needed to have a picture to show while I was talking about this, uh, were 752 first-year students at the University of Minnesota. They showed up to get tickets for this dance. They filled out these long questionnaires with all kinds of information about them, and then they were uh, supposedly being paired by a computer with somebody that would be a compatible partner for them. In fact, the researchers just randomly paired people up. The only thing they uh, took into account was they always made sure the male was taller than the female. So anyway, they were paired up with these other people. Uh, they went to this dance, and in the middle of the dance, they separated the males and females and took them to separate rooms to have them fill out questionnaires about their experience because they wanted to find out how well the computer dating was going. And they asked them questions like how much they liked their date, how much they thought their date liked them, how physically attractive they thought the date was, how similar they thought they were to each other. And then they went back and finished the dance. About six months later, they followed up with these people to find out if they ever went out with each other again. Now remember, they had all kinds of information about these people. But the only thing that predicted whether they dated each other again was how well they matched up on physical attractiveness. None of the other things in this particular study predicted that these people would see each other again. Now, I think in a situation like this, you're at a brand new university, you don't know people, uh, you want to get off to a good start socially, there might be special attention being paid to being seen with the right people, and physical attractiveness probably paid 
played more of a role there than it might in some other situation. So, in summary, physical attractiveness is a very important component of the whole interpersonal attraction process. And uh, like it or not, and we can say maybe we shouldn't pay so much attention to this, but we're fooling ourselves if we pretend that we don't.